And now, after looking at how we calculate the probability of detection versus signal-to-noise ratio for a single pulse, and seeing what that algebra is, let's just plot out it and look what it looks like for a few cases. Uh, in black is the non-fluctuating model. In, um, in red is uh, case 3 and 4, and and blue dots is case swirling case 1 and 2. And this is all for a probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6. For single pulse detection, uh, the swirling case 3 and 4 become the same, and 1 and 2 become the same. The results do. We see that for high detection probabilities, you need more signal-to-noise ratio is required to, to, to get high probabilities of detection. And that for a swirling case 1 and 2 target, to get 95% is the order of 12 dB greater is required where for probabilities of detection around 0.3 the signal to noise ratio is about the same and this difference between the non-fluctuating target and the fluctuating target is what we call the fluctuation loss and that needs to be put into the radar equation and remember now so far we've only looked at once the the detection of one pulse. When we look at multiple pulses, things get a little bit more interesting. And in this case, we're looking still with the probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6. We're looking at the integration of four pulses. And we're looking at under the three cases, a steady target with coherent integration of the four pulses in the black line and then swirling two fluctuations where the non-coherent integration is, takes place and we use frequency diversity to make the, the pulses independent one from another and that is this line here and swirling one fluctuations where we're coherently integrating at a single frequency the swirling one fluctuations. And we see that in this case, in some fluctuating target cases, non-coherent integration with frequency diversity, pulse to pulse, can outperform coherent integration. But more often than not, coherent integration is used because it's going to be part of the Doppler processing and the signal processing function we're going to do later, use later on. Okay. Now to see how things get even more confused, uh, when we look at 10 pulses, you can see that the integration loss, uh, a, pro a steady target, and the swirling case 4 is up here. Swirling case 1 is way out here. So there's a huge, huge fluctuation loss. And you can see that changing the frequency to make the targets independent, independent from pulse to pulse, imp improves your performance uh, considerably. And this is with a probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 8. Now, David Schnidman uh, developed an empirical formula for, um, for calculating the signal-to-noise ratio versus PD, PFA, and number of pulses. Albersheim did that, that for just a steady target, but when you get up to a large number of pulses, it's just plain quite complex and not amenable to back-of-the-envelope calculations things you could do on your, easily on your PC, uh, it, it, they're, they're numerical integrals and the like. And you'd like to have something that's good to a fra fraction of a dB. You can get it to see where you are in the ballpark for simulations, analytical calculations, and then you can go back and refine them with the exact numbers. And Dr. Schnidman put this together, and it's been published in the IEEE uh, 
Aerospace and Electronic Systems Journal, I believe. Uh, it, it, we have the, the quantity K, which for a steady target is infinite, and 1 for swirling case 1, N for the uh, case 2, N is the number of pulses, and a quantity alpha, which is, remember, this is an empirical formula, which is 0 for when you're integrating less than 40 pulses and a quarter when you're integrating more. And then you calculate this large qu quantity here, which depends on the probability of false alarm and the probability of detection that you'd like to calculate the signal to noise for. And it takes takes two great few graphs to show the equation. So the PFA and the PD are functions of the quantity eta. And then you see the calculate to calculate the signal to noise ratio in natural units. You calculate this quantity x infinity. It's a function of alpha and eta, which are defined in the previous page. And these two quantities, C1 and C2, which are here and here, and they depend on K and PD and PFA and PD down here. And this quantity C and DB is for this range of PD, C1, and for this range of probability of detection, C2. And the signal-to-noise ratio in natural units is just C times X infinity, this quantity, divided by N. And the signal-to-noise ratio in dB is just 10 log to the base 10. That can all very easily be put in MATLAB and is, is very amenable. And this logarithm is to the, uh, to, the, to the base E. Now, for one of the cases, uh, 10 pulses and PFA of 10 to the minus 6, we show here the error in calculation of probability of detection versus the error in the calculation of the signal-to-noise required. And it's within a half a dB at the extrema. And from 0.2 to 0.9, it's, it's pretty darn close there. It's within a quarter of a dB. Of a dB. But within 0.1 and 0.99 probability of detection, and 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 3 PFA, and 1 to 100 pulses of integration, uh, those calculations are good to that level. Now let's move on to the issue of constant false alarm rate thresholding. Uh, here we see a next grad image of a rain cloud. It, it's repeating the image. It's a color image of the rain intensity with a next grad radar at New York City. And we see this is a, it's a very strong image. If you can see the color, it's at least 20 dB. The, the different colors are each uh, 5 dB apart. So the rain here is easily 20 dB over the background black. And here's a case where we have an ideal case where there's noise. And here we have two targets, a weak one and a strong one. But there's very little variation. And here we have a noise spike. But it's a far different case to threshold data as a function of range. We have uh, a, a rain cloud that's a half a mile thick. And where do you set your threshold? And how do you do it? The way it's done is to adaptively set the threshold based on a measurement of the ambient background. So we need a methodology to set the target threshold that will be able to adapt to temporal changes in the background levels of noise or clutter, spatial changes, the clutter residue from rain in this case, and for other diffuse windblown clutter such as chaff. We have to deal with the sharp edges due to the spatial transition from one type of background noise to the rain cloud, and estimation distortions 
that are caused by nearby targets. If we have a air traffic control radar and it's in a very dense uh, aircraft environment like the Los Angeles Basin, you don't want nearby targets to set the background artificially high when you take noise samples samples on either side of the target to estimate what the background noise is. So all these things one has to adapt to. There are a number of different methodologies that have been developed over the years and I'm going to go through them with you. The first and the simplest is to develop uh, a, a constant false alarm window. Typically it's, it's, uh, it's developed by sampling in range are in range Doppler space. They are, the, they are the spaces where you'll have the ability to have a lot of independent samples. Certainly in range you can get very high range resolution and we know that as range goes out the actual physical cross range get, goes out linear with the range and so uh, the possibility that something physical is going on like a mountain range or a rain cloud far away in actual range you don't want to use angle cells is the point you don't want to use angle cells so people either use a set of cells in range adjacent to the target to be threshold and these are marked in blue or a set of range Doppler cells to estimate the background and to measure the mean level of that background. And the mean background estimate is just 1 over n, where you sum over the return, the voltage return from each of those cells. Now in red, we have these what we call guard cells, because we don't know that the target is in the center of that range cell. We could have such a high resolution radar that the the target could be between two range cells or two Doppler velocity cells. So we usually put, depending upon the, the actual physical thing that we're dealing with as a target and its space and its spatial extent of the target and of the cells we have available, this may be too, the, 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 the guard cells might be too thick before we say we're not going to include the target. Uh, and it, it'll depend on the physics of what's going on in the environment and the parameters of your, your radar as to whether you'll pick a rectangular or a linear way of estimating the background. But it's done. Now here's some rain background in linear units and I've marked it. This is an actual receiver noise here from data taken at C-band at 5500 megahertz. It's from uh, Fred Nathanson's book. And here we see a rain cloud that's 9 dB above the, at least above the receiver noise level. And this is about 2 dB is the receiver noise. And if you take and move a, a CIFAR mechanism where we want to find out the average background here, we take a set of cells here and here. We're going to get a good estimate of the background. And then you multiply that background by, say, a factor of 4. You'll get a probability of false alarm of about 10 to the minus 5 or 6. And you can, you can then, you've got a good physical estimate of the background. And then the question arises, what happens when the target of interest that you want a threshold is between as the slope of the rain is going up. Well, you're going to have some of the cells are going to be measuring low values and others are going to be measuring very high values. So sharp edges on the le uh, of interference or clutter can lead to excessive false alarms with this type of mean level threshold where you use in both the right and the left-hand side. We're collecting data from the right and the left-hand side to measure that mean noise level. Now, 
Another variant of that is the greatest of mean level CIFAR. And we divide up the right and the left-hand side into two regions. And we calculate a mean level for the first region and a mean level for the second region. And our ability to measure the, the mean level is based on the number of samples. So there's going to be a loss incurred by not having an exact level of the, of the noise. We're making an estimate of the noise, and so we're cutting down by a factor of two when we set two different levels. We take the greater of the two to determine the threshold. So we have n over two cells before and after. This helps reduce false alarmia, sharp quarter edges or interference, but nearby cells can still raise the threshold and suppress detection. Another method that's used is the censored greatest of CIFAR, where we could have windows on either side, and if we look at the individual cells on either side, and if they appear to be significantly greater than so many standard deviations of this, uh, st the standard deviation of this uh, 10 samples, we can throw them out and say, and they're probably due to a spurious target. So that we can use, again, the larger of each side, but we censor certain cells. And that, again, has the fact that we're using less. And the ordered, ordering the samples from each window is computationally intensive. And it, it adds more computation, but with Moore's Law, these things get easier to do. Now, I'm now going to show you the, if we had an ideal set where we made an infinite number of measurements, on what the noise was, that would be the matched filter. And here if we have 10 samples measuring the CIFAR with a PFA of 10 to the minus 6 and one pulse worth of data that we're that we are processing and uh, here's our signal to noise ratio versus PD. We incur different losses due to the fact that we're sampling with different numbers of pulses. You can see if we could get a hundred samples, we're having a very small CIFAR loss. The difference between the ideal and a hundred. When we up that, we lower that to 50 samples, the difference isn't too bad either. It's maybe uh, half a dB. But if we reduce the number to set 10 samples, we see that we can have uh, quite a significant, in this case, oh, 3 plus dB of loss due to, due to our ability to measure because we, don't, we haven't used enough samples. Now, this, this is another way to graph that previous curve. It's folding a lot of curves for probability detection of 10 to the, uh, 10 to the minus 9. And for the curve of P, PFA of 10 to the minus 6, you can see that the CIFAR loss goes up greatly for all the P, different PFA. If you're, if you're greater than, tw if you have less than uh, 20 cells, it, there's a significant difference and loss factor. If you have 15 cells and you're at 10 to the minus 8, well take a 10 to the minus 8 and you have 15 cells. You've got a 2, a two, two in change, 2.2 .2 dB CIFAR loss with a PD of 0.9. So the greater the number of reference cells in the CIFAR, the better the estimate of the clutter and the less will be the loss in detectability. And this is a very important thing to know. Now, this again shows you the same kind of data of CIFAR loss on a log-log scale for single pulse detection approximation. 
and it gives you uh, an ability to calculate what that loss is. Okay, and this this is good for typically 15 to 20. And since a finite number of cells is used, just to reiterate, the estimate of the noise or clutter is not a precise thing. So in summary, uh, for the whole lecture, both target properties and the radar design features clearly affect our ability to detect signals and noise. Targets fluctuate, and they sometimes don't fluctuate. We have to take the, the, the fluctuating properties of the target and sometimes the noise into account. When we do these, we, we calculate the probability of detection versus signal to noise and probability of false alarm. And also the allowable false alarm rate and integration scheme, if any, have to be taken into account. The integration of multiple pulses will improve our target detection. Coherent integration is the best when you have phase information available. And non-coherent integration and frequency diversity, as we showed you earlier, can improve the situation, but they're not as efficient. And we need to have an adaptive threshold detection scheme for real environments to set the thresholds appropriately, or we can be inundated with false alarms that will be correlated correlated in space and in time, and these we'll see when we deal with tracking targets, can give great problems to the output to the operator. And there are many different algorithms we showed you exist, but all of these algorithms introduce some loss and some additional processing. But And here are the references for this lecture. And next, here are the problems of Skolnik that you'll need to do for homework. Well, the next lecture will be radar cross-section. It has quite a, quite a bit of uh, material in it, um, about 25%, 30% more than in this lecture.